The average new car in America is now over $48,000, but today we're taking a look at something that is considerably more affordable. This is the least expensive Kia available in the United States at $16,450, and that earns this the title of the second cheapest new car in America with a standard automatic transmission. This is $200 more expensive than the Mitsubishi Mirage, which is the least expensive automatic transmission car. Now, the least expensive car period in the US right now is the Nissan Versa, at 15,830, it is less expensive than this, but it comes with a five-speed manual transmission. If you love manuals, that's a great option. If you don't love manuals, that Versa is actually gonna be $1,000 more than this Kia. Not only does the Rio have a low sticker price, it also has a long warranty. 10 years, 100,000 miles for the powertrain, five years, 60,000 miles bumper to bumper. So you might be wondering, why is there fog in the headlight with such a long warranty? Well, this one we rented from Turo because Kia does not have any Rios in the fleet for us to borrow. So I did the next best thing. I paid $60 a day to get this guy right here and test it out for a week. What better way to see how a Rio holds up? This particular model is a 2022, but there aren't any changes for 2023. And this one has definitely been rung around on the, the, uh, the tree here a bit. It's actually been in a few accidents and when I looked under the hood, the headlight module is cracked on the inside and that's why there is fog in the headlight. There's also a little bit of rash on the other side of the bumper. But I think this is a really great example of how durable a small car can be. With that disclaimer out of the way, let's get back to the Rio itself. This design is now a few years old and I think it's starting to show its age a bit. We don't have the most modern interpretation of the Kia Tiger nose grille there. And of course we get these big chunky halogen headlights. If you want full LEDs, they are available in the Rio though. $19,190 plus destination will get you full LED headlights up front and it certainly makes the front end look more modern. We have the latest Kia logo right there up top, but the rest of this is maybe Kia five years ago or so. That still makes this more attractive than the Mitsubishi Mirage to my eye, but I do think that the Nissan Versa looks a bit more stylish with the more modern Nissan grille and that big chrome U-shape up front. Let me know what you think about that down there. The tires, they're always pretty skinny at 185 width. This is actually about the size of some temporary spare tires on larger vehicles. And as you can see with those wheel covers, this has been a little bit roughly treated. We also have some rash back here from some sort of side swipe incident in the back. For 2023, the Rio comes two ways. You can get it as a four door sedan like this or a five door hatchback that's a bit more practical, but also a bit more expensive. All versions have a pretty short hood, and that really aids to the packaging efficiency that we find here. This is 10 inches shorter than a Toyota Corolla, but in terms of legroom and headroom, it's actually very similar inside. It's only about a half inch difference in terms of legroom. So just about as roomy as the larger Corolla with a price tag that's about $10,000 less than many versions of that Toyota. The trunk is a little bit smaller, but the difference is smaller than you might think. Now, the hatchback, it's going to be a foot shorter than this, but it's really going to give you very similar interior practicality. The cargo area is not going to be as long, but it is going to be taller, and we get a little bit more of a practical rear headroom area back there, although the headroom numbers on paper are very similar sedan to hatchback. Out back, we have all incandescent lights, but we do have an amber turn signal, which is certainly my preference. The exhaust tip is tucked up under the bumper, and this backup camera is definitely tacked on a bit like an afterthought. I would have hoped that Kia would have put it down here above the license plate or something like that, but nope, it is right there in the middle of that trunk lid. The camera location does give us a slightly better view of the rear bumper when you're parallel parking. Above that, we get the Kia logo, but you'll notice that there's no trunk release, no lock area, anything like that going on back there. If you want to open the trunk, you can press the button on the remote or you have to pull a lever inside. In addition to the LED headlights, the technology package also adds active safety tech that otherwise is not found on the Rio. Autonomous emergency braking, forward collision warning with pedestrian detection, and lane keeping assistance are only found on that technology package, and they're not on this particular Rio. That package also includes alloy wheels. These are steel wheels with covers. We also get rear disc brakes with that package, otherwise you get drums in the back. Push button start instead of a twist key auto climate control and auto high beams are also part of that package. 
As you'd expect in a small car, we find a small engine under this hood. It's a 1.6 liter four cylinder producing 120 horsepower, 112 pound feet of torque. In the US, you only get a CVT, no manual transmissions on offer, and that will give you 41 miles per gallon combined. That is a little bit lower than the Mitsubishi Mirage, but this is a considerably more powerful engine. That Mitsubishi only produces 76 horsepower, which is why it will take the Mirage 12 seconds to go zero to 60 versus 8.6 for this Rio. That's a full second faster than the Nissan Versa. That's an interesting twist because the Versa, of course, also uses a 1.6 liter engine. It also produces about 120 horsepower, but the CVT has a very different design. Rather than the belt design that's more common in small cars, this uses a chain style CVT that's more durable. It also shifts faster, and that's probably why this is a full second faster zero to 60 than that Nissan. Front seat comfort is pretty similar to the Nissan Versa and actually pretty similar to the Toyota Corolla as well. This is an entirely manual front seat setup. The driver's seat adjusts for height. The front passenger seat does not. It just slides forward and backward and the seat back reclines. The steering column, it's just a tilt design, not a telescopic design. So if you're shorter or taller than I am, I'm about six feet tall, you might wanna look at something that has a bit more adjustability. But for my body shape and height, this seat is pretty comfortable. Bearing in mind that the Rio is a subcompact sedan, rear seat legroom is pretty decent. This front seat's adjusted for me, again, at six feet tall. I have about three inches of legroom left. So in terms of legroom, basically the same as a Toyota Corolla. Headroom, actually very similar as well. If I try and put my head back here to the headrest, I do have to crane my head to one side, but sitting in a more natural position, my head's just brushing the ceiling. So you could put me back here for maybe an hour or so fairly comfortably. Of course, since this is a subcompact car, the rear bench is not terribly wide and the front seat tracks are pretty long. So if you're a taller person and you want something small and easy to park, this is gonna be a great option because of how far back these front seats go. You see, I actually can't put my knees on either side, or sorry, uh, right behind this seat. I gotta put them on either side there because the front seat moves so far rearward. Again, this seat over here, comfortably adjusted for me at six feet tall, plenty of room. That's how much further back those front seats go. Definitely further back actually than you find in a Corolla. At this point, some of you are probably wondering, why do I keep mentioning the Corolla? Since of course the Forte is the direct competitor to the Corolla from the Kia lineup. The reason is because this interior is about the same size as that Corolla. And as we're gonna get to in the performance section of this video, performance is interestingly similar to the Rio as well. When it comes to cargo capacity, the Rio surprised me a bit because we have a trunk that's a little bit larger than the Corolla actually, 13.7. My apologies earlier if I said this was smaller, it's actually the Corolla with the smaller trunk. And you cannot put a 22 inch roller bag in this position in a Corolla and still close the trunk lid, but you can do that in the Rio. And you can line several of them up right back here as long as they're not in the way of the hinge. You can actually put about three of them back here. And that's how I was able to squeak a surprising five 24 inch roller bags right back here in the trunk. Now, because of the Rio's dimensions, this is certainly more of a cargo slot rather than a traditional trunk. You'll notice that it is definitely more vertical than it is horizontal. Going in for a closer look, for some reason we have the floor mats back here and you'll notice that the Turo owner didn't really vacuum the car. There's a lot of sand going on there. Under the load floor, we find a spare tire. It's a T125 that is incredibly tiny. It's more motorcycle tire size than car size. We have a little foam block there because there is some additional storage space under that load floor if you wanna pack things around that spare tire. Speaking of load floor itself, it is certainly a little on the flimsy side, but what do you expect for $16,000? As we look around the interior together, keep the low base price of the Rio in mind. Again, this starts under $17,000. So some of the features in here are a bit surprising. We have a sunglass holder right here. We also have visors for the passenger and the driver that slide side to side, something I did not honestly expect to see. We also have a vanity light and mirror for the passenger as well. There's a grab handle over there for the passenger, actually three of them around the interior for the rear passengers and the front. Hide adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger two-way adjustable headrests, and then of course a fabric interior. Bolstering on the seat back and seat bottom cushions isn't terribly aggressive, and I do find the fabric pattern fairly attractive considering the price tag of the vehicle. If you'd rather have a slightly lighter interior, the fabric does change. You can get a medium gray in addition to this charcoal gray, but the rest of the interior components remain essentially the same. The front doors are made from entirely hard plastic, so hard plastic down there around that bottle holder, hard plastic armrest, 
hard plastic upper as well. Moving over to the dashboard, again, more hard plastics going on here, but the upper section of the dashboard has been treated with an anti-reflective coating. Here we have sort of a medium gray section in the middle to help dress things up. Tiny, tiny little air vents in the dashboard. Below here, we have all hard plastics and a bin style glove compartment. Looks like the Turo owner keeps his uh, disinfecting wipes and cleaning supplies in there. Decent amount of room. I was also able to take that out and fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside. In the middle of the dash, we find a standard eight inch touchscreen LCD infotainment system with wireless CarPlay and Android Auto standard as well. That's a bit surprising and something that you don't find in all the competition, even at higher price tags. Uh, the functionality of the system stays basically the same as you work your way on up to the top. No factory nav or anything like that, but we do get some extra radio functions in the more expensive version. Down here we find manual single zone climate control. Single zone automatic climate control is available. And interesting twist, if you get that model, uh, you also get an auxiliary input here. This one just has a USB charge port. We have a 12 volt power port over there on that side. Storage area right above, no wireless charging mat or anything like that. Storage area below. Pretty standard console shifter here with a manual mode over here to this side. And then there is a sport button right there behind that. Two decently sized cup holders. The armrest in the middle slides forward and backward. Handbrake right there. And then this opens to give us access to a fairly small little storage cubby in the middle of everything. The instrument cluster is a clean and easy to read design. If you get the base model, you don't get this small screen in the middle though. All trims have a urethane steering wheel. If you want something leather wrapped, you're going to have to move up to the next category where the Kia Forte is. Over on this side, we have the controls for the optional cruise control system. Cruise control is not standard, and you will find adaptive cruise control in some more expensive models. But in the direct competitive set, it's just regular old cruise control. There's also a trip computer button there. And then on the left side of the steering wheel, we have the controls for the infotainment system. A nice touch is that we also have a voice command button and dedicated phone hang up and pick up buttons. In case you're wondering, the base price does give you air conditioning, power windows, power door locks, and power mirrors. Now it's time to get the Kia Rio out on the road. Even with 32,000 miles on the odometer, this model went 0 to 60 in 8.6 seconds. That really surprised me because that's actually faster than a Nissan Versa by more than a second. It's actually 1.1 seconds faster than the last time we tested a Nissan Versa even though we have about the same amount of power under the hood. Now, part of that is because this is fairly light. It weighs under 2,800 pounds, but a lot of it also has to do with the way this continuously variable automatic transmission is designed. Again, this uses a chain style pull transmission rather than a push belt like you find in a lot of CVTs. That's part of why this also shifts ratios faster. So if I slow down here and then I floor it, it goes pretty immediately up to about 5,000 RPM. It does, of course, imitate shifts as well, but the shifts are a lot crisper than the shifts that you find in the Nissan Versa. This CVT reminds me a lot of the CVT we find in the Honda Civic. Definitely something to be reminded of when we're talking about a very inexpensive car. It also is a bit more believable as far as these stepped automatic shifts here go. If I use this, if I slow down especially, you'll really hear the difference here. Just that shift speed and the shift quality is much more like a traditional automatic transmission. In fact, some of the folks that were in here this week actually thought it was a regular automatic until you drive it just a bit more gently, then you'll really notice that the engine is just varying its RPM as you stay the same speed going up the hill, for instance. Now, any way you slice it, this is significantly faster than the Mitsubishi Mirage, but it's also a little bit faster than some of the options in the next size category up. For instance, a Toyota Corolla, last time we tested it, it was only a few tenths of a second faster zero to 60 than this. So this is right in line with a lot of compact sedans available in the US. The braking distances, those are, however, a little bit longer. Remember, this has really skinny tires on it. So it took this car 125 feet to stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero. Some of that could have to do with the drum brakes in the back. I think stopping distances are likely gonna be better in the model with the disc brakes. Also, fade characteristics are probably gonna be a bit better in that disc brake model, but I think this is perfectly acceptable considering the price tag. When it comes to the handling score, keep that tire size in mind. I'm gonna give this a B minus because you notice that the comparisons up there are compared to subcompact and compact stands because honestly, I think that the lines have been blurred these days. This is definitely bigger than a Corolla was several generations ago. So I think it's logical to compare this with that set. Some folks out there might be asking themselves, do I really need to spend $25,000 or $30,000 on a Corolla or a Civic 
What about spending sixteen or seventeen thousand dollars on something less expensive? So compared to those bigger options, obviously the suspension is not as elegant. It's going to get a bit more upset over broken pavement, but it is surprisingly composed versus other inexpensive cars. I actually think this has a slightly better level of composure than we find in the Hyundai Venue, now Hyundai's cheapest car in North America. That is a small crossover style hatchback. Uh, that suspension does get a little bit more upset. It has a really short wheelbase, so it tends to have a little bit more of a bobblehead feeling going out on washboard road surfaces. This doesn't have that particular problem, but obviously the grip levels just aren't the same. As with most smaller cars, when you're out on a rougher road like the one that I'm on here, you will definitely notice that there's a bit less time for the suspension to settle when the front suspension goes over a bump and then the rear suspension goes over a bump. Also, logically, the suspension design in this vehicle is not as expensive or as elegant as a more expensive car. So it doesn't ride quite as well as something like a Honda Civic, but it honestly does pretty well stacked up against the Mirage and the Nissan Versa, the two closest competitors, now that the Hyundai Accent is no longer sold in North America. There are a number of other less expensive vehicles you could choose in the US. Something like the new Chevy Trax is definitely a good buy. I think it rides a bit better than this, but remember that it's gonna be at least 25% more expensive than this. That's how inexpensive the Rio is. And that's why all things considered, I'm gonna give the ride quality a B plus. If you were just comparing this against a Nissan Versa or a Mitsubishi Mirage, the Mirage is gonna be at the bottom of the heap. This and the Versa are gonna be at the top. I think the ride quality in both of them is fairly equal. In our 50 mile an hour cabin noise test, I measured 73 decibels in steady state cruising, but you should know that potholes and bumps in the road definitely transmit more sound into the cabin than a Corolla or a Civic. So in straight line, regular smooth road surface driving, this is pretty similar to the average compact stand, but on a rougher road surface, say the potholes that are on this road, you're definitely gonna get more of that into the cabin. On the other hand, fuel economy has been fantastic. Over a week of mixed driving, we've been averaging 40 and a half miles per gallon. That puts this right in line with the Nissan Versa as one of the most fuel efficient non-hybrid vehicles you can get in North America. Remember that you will get better fuel economy in something like a Prius or a Kia Niro, but you're gonna be paying an awful lot more for those vehicles because the hybrid system is fairly expensive. And if you're worried about the longevity of a hybrid system, its battery pack, etc., then you might wanna take a look at an inexpensive high efficiency vehicle like this. Let's put the fuel economy number in perspective. Remember we have the same kind of legroom and headroom figures in here as a Toyota Corolla, very similar zero to 60 times. Actually, I think a slightly more engaging CVT and better fuel economy as well. If you want better fuel economy in the Corolla, you can get it with the Corolla Hybrid. That will certainly beat this, especially in city driving, but the Corolla Hybrid is gonna be significantly more expensive. Obviously, the story for the Rio is price and value. This is a seriously cheap car. Fully loaded, all in, with destination, we're just over $20,000 tax, title, license, maybe some floor mats and accessories, we're talking something that is solidly under $25,000 with CarPlay, with air conditioning, automatic climate control, a 10 year 100,000 mile powertrain warranty, LED headlights, and reasonably comfortable seats. Now, will you find more comfortable seats elsewhere? Absolutely. You will find more comfort elsewhere, a quieter cabin, faster zero to 60, better handling, etc. But all of those things are going to cost you more than this. You could look at something like a Chevy Trax. I think that is absolutely fantastic value, one of the best values in America, and a lot of fun to drive, but even it is going to be significantly more expensive than this because it will go up to about $30,000 fully in. It's gonna start pretty inexpensively, almost as inexpensively as a fully loaded Rio, but again, we're talking base Trax versus fully loaded Rio or Rio hatch. That's really the deal with the Rio. Are there better cars out there? Absolutely. There are a lot of better cars out there in North America. But are there better values out there? I would say you're hard pressed if you're simply looking for inexpensive affordable transportation to find a better value than this. I think this punches above its weight when compared to the Nissan Versa, its closest direct competitor. It is light years better than a Mitsubishi Mirage. The big thing with the Mirage is really just its low sticker price. It is significantly slower than this. It doesn't handle as well. It doesn't look as good. It doesn't feel as nice, etc. This is simply cheap and cheerful, affordable transportation. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. Hopefully we're gonna get our hands on a Nissan Versa. And the other thing I want you to sound out is, uh, should we be buying one of these? I've actually been contemplating buying a base Nissan Versa with a manual transmission 
or perhaps something like a base Rio to find out really what it's like to live with the cheapest cars in North America. Let me know if that's something that we should do or not uh, down there in the comment section below, and I will see all of you later. We are going to be getting a Nissan Versa over the next few months, and who knows, we may actually be buying one in order to do that video series on one. So uh, again, let us know if that is something you'd like us to do. Find me over at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of those social places, and I will see you all next week. Let's roll briefly through the highs and lows, then we'll get to pricing and, of course, comparisons. The Rio, excellent value. We also have a pretty roomy interior and definitely a very practical trunk. And that's important when we're talking about a vehicle that's trying to be all things to all people under $20,000. We also have a fairly high level of standard equipment. I like the fact that Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are both standard here. That's something that we don't find in all the competition. We also have Kia's long standard warranty, 10 years, 100,000 miles on the engine and the transmission, five years, 60,000 miles bumper to bumper. Both of those are longer than key direct competitors. And we don't have too many details on longevity of this drivetrain, but it does appear that the Hyundai and Kia CVTs have a better lifetime than we find in the uh, Nissan lineup, especially with the Versa. On the downside, if you get just the base model, you'll notice that you're lacking a few features that you might expect in a new car. And oddly enough, you cannot get certain safety features, or active safety features in the Rio that you will find in the competition, like blind spot monitoring and rear cross traffic detection. So with that out of the way, let's talk about exactly what you get for your dollar. $17,875 is the base version. Of course, you're going to get fewer speakers on the infotainment system. You're going to get a 100% folding rear seat back, so it doesn't split 60-40. That is a lot less practical than what you find in the other versions. You're also, of course, going to get a urethane steering wheel. You won't get alloy wheels, and you won't get cruise control in that base model. If you want things like the rear USB port, cruise control, remote keyless entry, not push-button start, mind you, just remote keyless entry, an armrest in the middle, 60-40 folding rear seat backs, and adjustable rear headrests. You have to get the S trim for $18,515. That is still relatively inexpensive as far as some of the competition goes. Once you've selected the Rio S, you can add one option package. There's really just one option period on the Rio. You choose a trim level. If you get the S, you get to choose the option package. It's an $1,800 option, which is about a 10% bump in MSRP. And it throws in some driver assistance tech. We don't get adaptive cruise control, but we do get autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian detection, lane keeping, auto high beams, and driver attention monitoring. This is also the only way to get LED headlights, which is certainly something I would get in the Rio. The base halogen headlights are certainly a little bit dim. You also get the Kia Connected Telematic System, XM radio, you get automatic climate control, push button start, alloy wheels, rear disc brakes, the rest of the lineup has drum brakes, and you get chrome door handles. Ooh la la. That puts the most expensive version of the Rio sedan at 20515 It's actually less expensive than the top end version of the Versa. On the other hand, the Versa does offer a few features you don't find available in the Rio, like adaptive cruise control, blind spot monitoring, and of course, a snazzy red paint job. The price range is definitely broader on the Versa. It starts just under $17,000 and goes to just over $21,000. But interestingly enough, no version will ever get disc brakes in the back. Outside the Versa, there really isn't much direct competition for the Rio. There is the Rio 5-door. It's going to be a little bit more expensive, basically the same sort of thing with a slightly more practical cargo area in the back. Or you could look at something like the Hyundai Venue or Chevy Trax. The Venue is going to be a little bit tighter on the inside, actually. It's bo boxier, so it's going to be a little bit more cargo practical in some ways, and it looks a little bit more like a small crossover. The Chevy Trax, on the other hand, definitely looks sort of like a inexpensive station wagon, I guess you could say. But either way, they're going to be a bit more expensive. The Trax starts at $21,495, which is a really good deal, but that's already more expensive for the base version than the most expensive version of the Rio. So exactly how much cross shop there will be, I don't really know. On the other hand, the Trax is absolutely fantastic for an inexpensive vehicle in North America, as long as you don't need all-wheel drive. I do like the base engine. It's a 1.5 liter turbo engine in the Chevy Trax. It also has a solid six-speed automatic transmission. If you're not a fan of CVTs, that's definitely a solid way to go. For me, at least, the more interesting thing about the Trax is that all versions handle really well. Chevy decided to put some strangely wide tires on every version of the Trax. Handling is absolutely impeccable. The interior is roomy. 
The base trim does get some slightly low rent gauges and a smaller infotainment screen than you might see out there in most of the advertisements. But if you move up just one or two levels in the product lineup, you do get the bigger screens. And as a result, the interior is certainly going to feel more modern and more tech focused than you'll find in the Versa or in the Rio. If my money were on the line, I would probably lean towards the Chevy Trax. But keep in mind that Trax is probably going to be 10 to 15% more expensive by the time you've added some of the options that you probably want on that Chevy. And of course, you still won't get the long standard warranty. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. What would your pick be? And are you really interested in inexpensive vehicles like this? I would have thought that the market was really clamoring for this uh, based on the number of comments we get down there in the comment section about inexpensive vehicles. But sales of the Mirage haven't exactly been lit on fire. Sales of the Versa are actually significantly down in this generation versus the last generation model, the Rio. I'm actually surprised that it still exists. Hyundai's actually killed the Accent or Ascent, whatever we wanted to call it. Uh, and that's because it just wasn't selling terribly well. Doesn't seem like anybody out there truly is interested in a brand new car for under $20,000. And I just think that's a pity. Let me know what you think. And I'll see all of you later.